So it's super great to be here. My name is uh, Mitch, Mitch Joachim. I'm an architect and urban designer in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I am the co-founder of Terraform One, and I'm associate professor in practice at New York University and co-chair of Global Design NYU. Uh, the work that we're doing currently now is all about extinction, as we saw in Carol's talk uh, before. It's absolutely vital. We meet some of these metrics within the next 11 years, according to the United Nations and others. Uh, and some of the facts are rather scary, which is 50% of everything. It's most mammals on this planet, corals, fish, bird, and especially insects are disappearing. Lost half of them on the planet since the 70s. Every seven minutes, another species on this planet dies. Uh, something like the white rhino, this is a creature that can now be called an endling, because there's only two of them left. Uh, design specifically, uh, uh, the, the, in combination with business, almost ignores the platforms that we need to restore these creatures. Uh, biodiversity is less than 5% of point systems devoted to certifying buildings green in every, pretty much every known system that's out there. There's a research uh, project done by a group in Denmark. So it's LEED, BREAM, Living Building Challenge, which is better, well certification, et cetera. So less than 5% or around 5% even cares for uh, other stuff besides human needs. And not that those are not important, but we, I think we've really got to get the focus to uh, what I call ending extinction or design against extinction. That is essentially our single uh, operating predicate on the work that we look at. Our population is increasing. We'll have about 11 billion people by the end of this century, 9 billion by other terms. What does that mean for how we live, how we move, how we work, and how we build? Uh, even the things that we eat. We're gonna double the amount of steak and food that we stick in our faces. I enjoy eating meat. I, I had some today at Starbucks. Uh, I, I don't want everyone to just immediately go on to some other kind of diet, but using design and the power of our imagination to rethink those systems and do it in a logic that gets people to uh, uh, rethink our consumption of uh, protein. And also dealing with vehicles and systems on streets that there's just more stuff than you can ever imagine from scooters to smart buses, autonomous vehicles. Uh, it is a very difficult and intractable problem. We look at all different scales simultaneously in our think tank at Terraform and try and solve these problems. Some of them take five years, some of, the some of them take 15 years, some of them probably will be solved by a grad student long after we're dead. Uh, this is what we call socio-ecological design. It is coming together at the table with not just a bunch of elite architects and scientists, but incorporating almost everybody in the neighborhood so they can ask some naive questions and lead to new research tracks that gets our, our projects underway and helps us rethink some of these problems. So I'm just gonna show a couple of solutions on how we will maybe be able to move in the future, certainly how we'll be thinking about eating in the future and how we live. Uh, there's a project I did on the movement side at MIT uh, with Axel Killian, someplace there, uh, where we were doing our, our doctoral research under William Mitchell. These are organic soft cars made out of different types of air bladders and ETFE foil pillows. They move in flocks and herds. They rub up against one another. They don't need to move faster than 30 miles an hour, which is the speed limit in Shanghai, Paris, and New York. And they're designed to share streets with pedestrians. Uh, this was the vehicle that was produced from that lab. I think it was over 15 years of work from many different doctoral students. The Heroku car, which is a car that stands up, spins on a dime. It's this kind of smart car from MIT. Uh, it has been discontinued. That doesn't mean the work itself isn't relevant. It's perme permeated through everybody in the car and manufacturing industry, but it's still these ideas that take a long time to get others on board. And then thinking about it holistically, all these movement systems in tandem with a city that is uh, super ecological. Here we have vertical farms growing on the sides of buildings, uh, vertical access wind turbines, independent battery packs in, in, uh, in, in, in the lighting systems, trackless uh, trains, uh, replacing streets with greenways and riparian corridors, having some level of automation uh, to take care of some of these systems, but all of that becoming this kind of civic grand green space and transforming our cities. Uh, now this was another project about more things about how we eat if we're gonna go off of movement. This was our client for a few years, still is our client. Uh, actually thousands of these guys, it was crickets and we work with live organisms. Uh, we unfortunately kill a lot of them. We don't mean to, but that's part of the research. Uh, and we do eat these things. And the concept here was to replace 
cow-based protein, lamb, chicken, etc. the stuff that you eat with insect-based protein, which was mandated in 2013 by the United Nations. I do not want to eat a screaming face with legs and wings dipped in chocolate, uh, but a powderized form of this actually is really something that I think others can consume, especially the average American and European. Uh, why do that? Because it's 2,000 gallons less water to consume uh, insect-based protein versus something like uh, from a cow. It's also 300 times less carbon emissions in the atmosphere for insect-based protein than cow-based. You can compare the land use diagrams. I certainly can't go over it, but this is 100 acres for livestock producing the same amount of protein per year, and this is urban space, just three acres of it, to get your insect-based systems. Here, we looked at all different types of research. Some a student of mine in Canada was looking at growing crickets uh, for, for human consumption. Uh, we actually produced this shelter system. It's a combined shelter uh, and place for uh, harvesting or farming crickets at a high throughput volume. Each one of these containers is basically a bag of chirp chips, provides your protein every six weeks. They die naturally. Uh, as they get really old and fat, and then we consume them, uh, and we turn them into a, a powder. Those crickets, uh, are, those, are, those are model crickets. They didn't, they, they didn't escape. We just put them out there for scale, so you have an idea. We, we have a, a patent on, uh, uh, on this system, a utility patent. Here are this dialogue chamber and a harvesting uh, uh, a sack, and then the circulatory mechanisms that allow the crickets to move throughout the shelter and propagate their genes. Uh, it's also something that could be extended uh, so that wherever you put this in an urban space, it could move from something uh, that's, that's just used once or in a small area to something that can extend to a much larger scale. It's also we celebrate the sound of uh, the straddulation of crickets with these <coughs> horn systems. So we got high, high pressure volumes of air going across the top, naturally vent through the stack effect here, and out these little wind cowls on the top, you would hear the chirping of the male crickets as they move their legs back and forth. We accentuated that with cricket horns, so you know your client is really happy if you hear all of that chirping. That chirping means they're having sex. So it, we designed brothels, which are these things, the cricket sex pods. Uh, for where the females give these come hither looks, uh, the males do their chirping, they reproduce and move throughout the shelter, and then humans get to eat them after they die naturally. This is a farm pod project, which is bringing food to your home. Uh, so here is a, a, a concept of uh, I, what I guess IKEA now has a version called, uh, I don't remember what it's called, but they took our idea. Uh, and this is a, a version where you grow food inside a sphere instead of a green wall. It's a green ball, comes in almost any size. It's flat packed, robotically milled. You assemble it, put in these pleated surfaces, and you grow high, not, you grow high yield crops, not corn or wheat or stuff you can do in a field, but stuff like arugula or mints or spirulina that you would have direct uh, uh, access to, have an understanding of where it came from, and put that inside your salads. Then other projects are about uh, also dwelling. It's how we live. This is the entire history of chair design in one slide. So we go from bespoke manufacturing, where there's understanding of the craftsmanship and the artifact that you make, industrial design furniture, thank you Gropius, Charles and Raims, and then 21st century, which is growing stuff in a lab. Here is a, a, a combined system between mycelium and acetobacter. Doing this in an incubator that we custom built. This is now 10, 12 years old, this research. But you can see that in seven days of growth, we go from agricultural waste to the mycelium systems. That's my daughter on a chair that she can eat in her kindergarten. And showing that we can do these chairs made with bamboo, agricultural waste, uh, this is for human size, and grow them into a triply curved surface out of the mycelium. Uh, and that's uh, showing the, the final object. This is uh, another, I got two more projects, uh, uh, using a technology that's 2,500 years old. It's called pleaching or grafting in osculate matter to form one singular vascular system. It's the Fab Treehab project. This has also been going on for 15 years. Here's what's something new about it. This is a bioreactor system that we are, uh, have been building for two years. Essentially, it's all about the root structure. So the previous video was very much about the scaffolding, excellent. We actually are concentrating in growing the roots into a, 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 a very long, usable length. What does that mean? Well, here's the chamber in practicality. It's super dark, super wet, and it's 
teasing the roots all day long. They will never get to soil. So they have all their hormonal signature devoted to growing one single tap root. It grows at a very long, singular monolithic length, constantly looking for soil. It does not spread out dendritically. And after teasing it for about a year, year and a half, we pull out that big, long, wet noodle, and we have a living two by four. We tap into the soil, it lignifies, the bark gets on there, leaves propagate, and we wrap it on a scaffold. We have a patent on this, but it's a technology we've been working on for many years to produce a project like this. We cannot solve doors and windows, that's for another talk, uh, fine. And this is the last project I'm gonna show because time is up. Uh, this is about specifically dealing with extinction. We had a client come to us with a building, eight stories in New York City. Uh, he wanted to do something, I don't know, a brick lump. We don't do that kind of work. We do super ecological one work. He said, if you give us a chance to save a creature from oblivion, we'll work on the project with you. So we produce a double skin facade for the monarch butterfly. Essentially, it's a vertical meadow for something that's disappearing. We've lost over one billion of these butterflies, beautiful orange butterflies uh, that are native to North America, especially the Northeast. Uh, one billion of them disappeared. It's nine out of 10 are gone. We need to save them before they completely disappear. Uh, so this is a system that has uh, uh, in the skin of the building itself, milkweed, which is what they need to survive. It's got uh, areas for chrysilli to propagate, areas for caterpillars to eat, and then of course the adult butterflies, which live for a certain amount of time, eight weeks, and then they're released into the wild or into the wild of New York City. This double skin system wraps around the building to a pollinator garden and education center on the roof, goes through the atrium in the center and on into the back. It's only three feet, extra square footage in the floor space. You do not compromise any of the commercial area in this building. It's got large screens on the front so that you can see the activity of the butterflies from far away so you know what's happening in there. Uh, and that you can tell your friends, my God, butterflies are being saved. The technical term for this kind of project is called a lepidopterium, where it's a, essentially a place for uh, growing or, or harvesting butterflies. We got a grant from Intel, uh, around $200,000, to create artificial butterflies. These were drones that were there to service uh, through temperature control, humidity, control the amount of food, and milkweed replacement. So the artificial drones look after the living butterflies and are able to help maintain the space. We don't use, uh, these are painted ladies, we're looking at feeder systems. We don't use actual monarchs because we don't want to kill a species that's at the edge of extinction. We also have another project uh, in tandem with this for the American Museum of Natural History, working on all of their insectarium. We produced uh, uh, feeder systems for monarchs. These are live monarchs on these feeders. This is a double skin system with the milkweed inside the building. And then I, I just want to get to the, the last two slides. These are the feeders and the, the, the uh, diagrid structure on the exterior. This we, uh, we're working in full scale with uh, these butterflies, finding out the systems that are more appropriate for them to drink sleep, eat, hang out, have sex. That's uh, what bugs do. Uh, and then developing a system with a, a super lightweight um, uh, uh, hemp impregnated concrete from BASF to build it at scale uh, in, to fire code in the building. This is some of these shapes from uh, 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 moss-based ones to things that hold artificial flowers to other areas for feeders that get integrated into this double skin facade for the monarch butterfly to save them versus extinction. My time's up. I don't think I have time for questions, but thank you very much. Thanks, guys, for listening.